Hi, my name is Max Strawn and I'm the director here at the CWB Association. Now, hopefully you've looked me up in the past and seen that I used to make videos when I was a teacher. And I used to love making videos about metallurgy. I had a series called Make Metal with Max. Check them out. But today I'm going to talk a little bit about something specific in metallurgy that I get asked all the time. Just two weeks ago, I had a student ask me this. Can I quench my test plates? So we're talking about either a CWB test, AWS test, whatever it is. But if you're gonna test the plate, bend it, can I quench it? So when would you quench plates? Well, students quench all the time. You know, you got limited time, you got lots of welding to do. It's very normal to weld your plates out, quench them, weld them out, quench them, just to get lots of welding done in a day. But can you do that in a test situation or should you do that in a test situation? especially if you're falling behind or you're in a hurry. Can you quench the plates? Will it affect the band? Will it break them? Well, I'm not gonna give you a definitive yes or no answer because every situation is different, but I will explain to you what's happening and why you need to think about it. So let's start with quenching. What is quenching? Well, let's talk about the normal state of steel. So in the normal world, steel's at room temperature and it's happy. I have my little iron atom here. So throughout the drawings, this is gonna represent my little iron atom. At room temperature, it sits at BCC, which means body centered cubic. It's a perfect cube in all three directions. This is how they all line up together to make a piece of steel. This is my lattice. So all irons are all lined up and it's my happy little iron lattice that's part of my steel structure. The little reds for the purpose of the day are by carbons. I got a little bit of carbon in there, good for it. So I heat up my atom, it expands all three directions perfectly equal now that's normal i heat it up the lattice grows you can see it when steel heats up it actually gets bigger that's my fcc happening it becomes austenetic which means it doesn't conduct electricity it's not magnetic it's free flowing now things have expanded things get loosey-goosey carbons can move lattice can shift things can shift around but if i do things nicely it'll shrink back down to the exact same shape it was before. This is a perfect scenario. I have my steel, I weld on it, it grows, it goes back to the original shape. No stress, no distortion, everything's perfect. That's best case scenario in any welding situation. Now when I quench, what happens? I have my normal steel at room temperature, I heat it up, I get it to FCC, which means it's starting to change color, not melting. We're talking 4,800 degrees here where things start to change color. That changing of color means that you're getting into FCC and then I quench it. Well, that forces things to get stuck. It didn't have time to go back to its happy cube. So it got stuck in BCT, that's body center tetrahedral. That just means that I got a funky shape. So you can see here, I ended up long on one side of my atom. It could have been in any of the directions or even an otter shape, but what happens is that it affects my whole lattice. So here, my, my quench shape, my BCT, has affected my lattice. It made it longer in one direction than the other. Also, you notice that my carbons kind of got together. On the top one, where everything was happy, the carbons were spaced out evenly. Here, because the carbons want to hang out with carbons, like attracts like, they got stuck. I froze it, the lattice is long, and my carbons are in one area. Now, stress adds strength. You can always remember that for all steel. Strength, it comes from stress. So, if I have stress from my BCT shape, my lattice is already harder than it was before. And now my carbons have pocketed into an area which adds more hardness in that area because the carbons disrupt the lattice too. Stress adds strength. So I got a double whammy. Shape and carbons creating a hard spot there. Now is that bad? Not necessarily. Sometimes you want steel to be harder. So as I work with heat, as I work with the alloys like carbon, I can increase the hardness without really changing anything other than just changing when I cool it and how I cool it. But what are the drawbacks? Well, as you increase hardness, you make it more brittle and less flexible. The wonderful thing about steel is that it's flexible and strong. As I give it more strength, I take away that flexibility. Sometimes that's not great. If you wanna bend the plate, that could be not great. So you gotta think about that. So. Back to the question, can I quench my test plate? Well, we got a piece of the answer here. We know that we're hardening the plate, but are we hardening it enough that it's gonna make your test go sour? Let's see. 
So the next thing we're going to talk about is Martin site. Well, what is Martin site? People are like, like to throw that term around. Oh, if I quench it, it create Martin site. Well, yes and no. Martin site's based on two things. One, that lattice. Now, when I look at a plate, let's say this is a four by four or six by six inch plate. My lattice is not clean from one end to the other. This is made in a giant pot of molten steel. They roll them out to create plate. The lattices all start from a seed. One seed will cool in each area and start its lattice structure from spreading. You can see it in snowflakes. One snowflake spot, the lattice grows out from that snowflake. Same thing with steel. The first seed to cool down creates the seed of the lattice and then the lattice grows out from there. As these grow out, they run into each other. So you can see all my different shapes of lattices here going in different directions. They all meet each other and at every junction of these, it's called a grain boundary. That's where the lattices are running into each other. This is normal, this is great, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're welding, it's good to think about that. You look at your plate and you think, this is not homogenous. There's a grain, just like wood. Electricity likes to follow lattices. So when you're getting arc flow or any other issues, you may just have some weird lattices in there that you're trying to work with. But that aside, we have our lattices, we have our grain structure. Then we add in carbons. There's gonna be carbons, any alloys spread out through here. Now for martensite to occur, you need to have enough stress within one of these segments or all, but generally you go lattice by lattice and you need to have enough carbon. Do I have those requirements on my test plates? Well, test plates are done on A36 or 44W plates, which have generally about 0.25 to 0.28 carbon, which is not enough carbon to actually create a hardened martensite. That's considered a low carbon steel. So do I have the lattice structure for martensite? Yes, you can have hardened. I can harden this plate, but if I don't have enough carbon, I'm not creating a true Martin site. I'm not getting that full grain migration within the lattices to create Martin site. So can I create harder plates by quenching A36? Yes, they'll be a little bit harder. Yes, they'll be a little bit more brittle, but is it gonna be enough to actually affect the bend of the test plate or to create pure Martin site? That's debatable, not, not by science. Now, would you risk it? I wouldn't recommend it. Could you do it? That's up to you. Look at the material, look at how fast you cooled it, how thick it is, and of course, the carbon content. Now, I mentioned something in there, grain migration. That's the last piece of the puzzle. I'm gonna explain it over here. I'm gonna give you an example of making some freezies here. So, this is a great example because water is a crystal and it reacts like metal in many ways. I have my water, my cup of water. I drop in the Kool-Aid mix it all up and I got my nice red Kool-Aid there. And I said, you know, if I just let this sit on the counter for a long time, or I boil it and then let it cool down, I will eventually boil out the water and I'll end up with a thicker and thicker and thicker solution. Eventually I can boil all the water out and I'll end up with the same solution that I started with. That's kind of like the perfect steel world where I add, I can remove, but if I control the temperature nicely, I'm not affecting either of the products and I end up back where I started. But if I take my cup of Kool-Aid and I throw it in the freezer, what happens? Well, because the cold's coming in from all the directions in the freezer, you'll actually get really clear grain migration where the sugars and the juice will get pushed into the middle and the water gets sucked to the outside. Any one of us has done it. When we were kids, we all tried making freezies. And it's not the same as the freezies you get from the store. You pull out the popsicle and it's all gooey sugar on one side, clear water on the other, and flaky kind of ice cubes that are not very homogenous. Why did that happen? Well, it happened because of grain migration. The sugar, the coloring, the ingredients, and the water, all are different parts of that solution that freeze at different times and they want to hang out with each other. Now, when you mix them nicely, they're happy floating around, but if you freeze them, you force them to go to their groups and you get the grain migration. How does that work with steel? We're gonna use the example of stainless because this is a really good example of how grain migration can ruin your test plate. So in stainless, it is stainless steel, so we still have iron and we have carbon. So there's my O's for my irons. There's my little red carbons. Remember, carbons add stress because they're at the intersections of the neighborhood. So it's already a little bit stronger from the iron. 
Then I add nickel, different shape. I add chromes, different shape. Nickels are in green, chromes are in blue. Now I have a lot of stuff going on here in stainless steel. I got three different alloys and I got my iron. What happens if I heat this up? As I start to heat this up, it starts to expand, right? All my lattices get loose and it starts to expand. And if I get too hot, if I get the lattice too loose, like attracts like, the carbons are gonna go to each other, the nickels are gonna go to each other, and the chromes are gonna go to each other. And it can happen so badly that it'll actually fully separate, just like that freezy. And it's a mess, just like that freezy. We call it sugaring or crystallizing of the stainless. On the back, you'll see it actually looks like little salt crystals. Those are pieces of the material separating out from the main structure. Can you fix that? Nope. Can you get those to mix back together? Not really. Can you bend that test plate after you've crystallized it and sugared it out? Not even a chance. In the industrial world, if you ever get there, that's a complete cutout. And in a test situation, you're gonna have to scrap that and start over. So here's an example of how not watching your temperature and not watching what happens with the grains can really affect you adversely. In the perfect world, you wanna work with stainless, very controlled. Warm it up, no further than the critical limit. Then cool it down very slowly so that everything stays nice and spaced out and you maintain the structure of that stainless steel. So, for yourself, if you're welding stainless on a test date, very careful about your heat. If you see those crystals show up, you cooked it, grab a new plate. Don't even try bending it, it's probably a fail. If you have normal A36 or mild steel, can you heat it up red hot, quench it? It'll probably still bend fine, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's up to you. Now in the industrial workplace, this is great to know. When do you want something to be maybe a little bit harder? You can make normal steel harder without any danger. If you have high carbon steel or tool steel, you definitely don't want to play this game because you'll have too much carbon. Then the pockets will create, you'll have issues. I hope this makes it easier. I hope you understand a little bit about what's going on inside your steel when you're welding it. I think this is a great question and I love it for students to try. I know that I would always do this with my students. I'd weld a plate and quench it and bend it and it would bend fine. You know, sometimes they get scared about too many uh, variables. At the end of the day, a solid weld is a solid weld. So try to stay to the good parameters. If you have any more questions about metallurgy, this is my passion. I love teaching this stuff. Reach out to me anytime, Ask Max 75 on Instagram. Or if you have questions for me at the CWB or the CWB team, reach out anytime at the CWB Association on our social networks. Really enjoyed doing this. I'll catch you at the next one.